services such as 3D printing, laser scanning, virtual reality rendering, and equipment, as well as managed print services where we place equipment and also provide cost recovery software, as well as document services such as document hosting and collaboration and interacting with many platforms out there for the purpose of document and information management. I'm joined today by Arthur Young Spivy. He'll be conducting the design for 3D printing webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat window. They will be answered either as they're entered or at the end by Arthur. Thank you very much. And uh, here's Arthur. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, today's presentation. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. You're going to see some uh, amazing projects that people are doing with the technology and across the board, uh, how it's helping everyone in, in different industries, not just within the architectural industry. And then we'll start to also dive into specifically software details, um, depending upon which package you're working with. That could be you know, anything from SketchUp to Rhino to Revit, what have you, any of those softwares, we can go directly to the different types of 3D printing. Um, so to begin with, um, what I'd like to just sort of demonstrate is design for 3D printing and some of the methodologies uh, that are important when it comes to, to 3D printing and just how to optimize so that your model can be sent right to the machine because it makes what it sees. Um, we've definitely have hit this threshold, if you will, or the, or the tipping point where the technology is so, if you will, readily available almost at your fingertips to take whatever design you've created and whatever stage in the process you are, and that will go essentially right to the machines with a little bit of you know, massaging the, the wall thicknesses and things like that. We'll, we'll touch those details shortly. Um, one of the first things I just wanted to kind of like really just to take it outside of the specific architectural industry specifically is this was a very interesting uh, revelation that kind of happened where Amazon's really kind of, you know, taken to the technology in a way that, you know, they already have the distribution centers already up and, you know, it's filled with, you know, tens of thousands of items all over, you know, this, uh, this industry. And, one of the things that they're definitely starting to do with this patent is this idea or this concept of the mobile 3D printing factory, uh, where what will happen is you, know, you just go online and you'll order this attachment for your vacuum cleaner, you know, or it could be for your doorknob or what have you. And you order the, the device and what they plan on doing was then sending it to a printer that would then be located on a truck. Um, and the, the reality of it is it still takes quite some time to, to actually 3D print. It's not instantaneous. Um, so probably what you'll see is sort of a hybrid approach where they'll have the three machines at each distribution center and they'll pre-make, let's say, 10 of those items and then Someone will order, you guys may order three or so are sold that day, and then they'll ship out those three and then start printing three more. So that's definitely in terms of you know, how the technology, again, just talk about that tipping point where we're at. Um, this is, again, a, a makeup company, Chanel, is talking about 3D printing, you know, the brushes for a mascara. It's like, well, when you think about the traditional process of how these brushes are made, you would essentially only, you know, could make, if you will, one style. They're talking about producing 50,000 units a day, and you can kind of see here from the image that they could make all the brushes, and they're all different. It doesn't matter in terms of scope, scale, and capabilities of what the technologies can do. Uh, and they're actually producing brushes that are more capable than the traditional manufactured route. Goodyear. So this 
is a tire that um, is really kind of a, a, a sort of a, a hybrid approach in many different ways where the tire itself is made of recycled rubber, recycled tires that are used as sort of the substrate, if you will, to then 3D print. But they're also adding this other, if you will, organic level where they are potentially embedding this living, breathing moss material that will then, um, that moss material will then absorb the CO2 and then put back out into the air O2. So you're scrubbing the air as you're driving around. Um, again, this is still kind of like, again, a, a conceptual, but this is, again, just look at the technology in a whole new kind of way. Zahadi Architecture. So they're showing this at the Milan show currently where they're, they're, they've printed out some furniture pieces. These are larger than life definitely designs, and we're not talking about mass manufacturing. What we're talking about is the capabilities to create designs that you couldn't make before. And that's truly, again, part of that tipping point is what can you make now that's new that you couldn't do before? Um, so this is a chair, um, and you see that just the gorgeousness of that, the one strip that they've used to create this piece, and then you know, it's on display where next thing next to this guy, which is the bow. Uh, the this is being printed all as one piece of geometry. This was not assembled. Uh, this came out of the machine as you're seeing it on the screen. Emerging objects. This is a design team out of Oakland. Um, Ron and Virginia. They're a phenomenal team, and this specifically. Uh, within San Francisco, they're looking at how to create these, if you will, these new housing environments that people can place in their backyard. And for, especially from a zoning aspect, what's interesting is the city, the municipality has, has sort of released and allowed what they consider to be a building to kind of have a little bit more flexibility. So this cabin uh, that's been 3D printed you can see the details, everything is modular in many respects. If we now look at, you know, just the material substrate, it's not just plastic, it's not just metal, it's, it's combining different types of materials that go into the actual substrates that's then built to create the, the actual geometries. This is uh, the, the city hall in, in Antwerp and what's the, the, the process that they're looking at this is they have to do some renovations on the model. And they initially did a 3D scan of the actual geometry. You know, so you have existing conditions, you have as built, which as many of you may know, the blueprints generally don't reflect what's actually here in the real world. So to start with a 3D scan, this is the actual 3D printed model. The amount of detail that we're seeing is phenomenal, right? And again, this was, even though was por portions of this were printed as one piece of geometry, here you can see it in the machine, there's still support, there's still materials that have to be removed in post and assembled. But the size of what you're printing this initially is just, you know, it's it's called the mammoth stereolithography, and it's printing a laser in the laser is centering each cross section as it's being printed. Here's the final, you know, finished component, and you know they made the whole thing light up uh, from from both sides. So again, as as a study model, this definitely takes it to that next level. Right, so let's jump into some of what we would consider, and we've been 3D printing for over 20 years, specifically within the architectural engineering and construction industry. So these are just kind of like the stages and process of what we would kind of put out there as ways to help optimize for 
the additive manufacturing or 3D printing process. One thing I think that we're all familiar with is that the model that you were using for renderings to show fly-throughs or animations or even just quick still or still shots to a client, that's not the same 3D model that you're using for construction documents. And in that regards, 3D printing or models you're going to be setting to the technology kind of falls somewhere in between, if you will. So in the past where we had, if you will, just plans, orthographic elevations, we just had a 2D view, that was not enough information. Uh, so the things that we have now when we have 3D models at a construction document level, that's almost too much information. So now we got to kind of back out. We kind of could turn off layers or, you know, the things that we know that we don't need to be printed. So in terms of stages and process, you've built your model one-to-one -one in your 3D software. The first thing that we have to then establish is what architectural scale is the model actually going to be made at? Once you've chosen that architectural scale, that's when we start to take measurements off of the model. Those measurements, because people, someone's often ask, how thin can something be printed? There's no de facto quantifiable, like you can only go this thin. If something is attached to another piece of geometry or if it's standing off on its own, those can be two very different types of how thin can something be, if you will, just in general. It may be at that point in time, you may have to take that mullion or you may have to take that railing or you have to take that detail and thicken it up. You may have to double it or triple it in some instances. And even though it's not necessarily to scale, we at the very least know that it can be printed. And when you put that in front of a client, they're more than happy and ecstatic to see their model, a physical version of it created. One, another factor, the third factor is actual then materials. What material are you actually going to make the model in? So this material that we're talking about is with, that you can print in wax, you can print in concrete, uh, there are machines that are there are machines that you can print in um, you know uh, metals so these different materials will also play a part to the types of details and there are times when we'll actually mix and match the different technologies to create <laughs> larger image and just a little housekeeping, if, if you wouldn't mind, everyone, if you're not currently muted, if you can please mute your line. Uh, that way we don't hear, hear any feedback on the line. Okay, thank you. So there are times from a model making standpoint, we may laser cut, we may CNC route, a, topo a topological map, we may uh, laser cut the acrylics and in post, we glue that all together. So initial build size or envelope is never a limitation because we can always print in parts and pieces and then glue that to get together to create the larger component or a larger site. From the different types of 3D software, these are generally the neutral formats that all the 3D printing printers are understanding in order to produce the file. Um, so if you're doing monochromatic versus a model that say has textures, colors, those are two different file types. And there's some overlap. All the, the files that can be printed in color, you can still tell to print monochromatic. Um, but currently right now, there are at least five different companies that have different color capabilities. But then that's very, you know, dependent upon if you're a little bit more residential or if you're commercial, you may or may not be printing in color or monochromatic. But just know that there's no cost or price differential if you print color or monochromatic. It's the same because when we're going to printing, it's how much materials actually used 
in the printing process. When we start to talk about, again, optimization for printing, is your geometry one continuous shape, form, detail? Are they overlapping? Are they touching? Are there two surfaces in the same place at the same time? Those are the kind of things that, depending upon your printing technology, you have to be into, the model has to be optimized for that technology. Two specific aspects that we are very important are the normal direction. And we'll show an example of that later, but essentially what side is the, the direction of the face or the polygons, what, what direction are they facing? And then naked edges refers to the actual you know, geometry where the surfaces touch each other, are they actually joined together? So in general, when it comes to 3D printing, it has nothing to do with if the model is a surfaces or solid. It has everything to do with if the model is watertight. Okay. This is a quick snapshot that shows the workflow just in general that you can begin to kind of just in your mind's eye. And this is just a snapshot of just some of the software. This is not just dedicated only to these software. If you're going and working in a software like SketchUp, the tools that are built within SketchUp have some, some base rudimentary ways to examine the model to see if it's ready for printing. But one of the things that if you have in your pipeline, a software like Rhino has some more robust tools, and we'll see some of that a little bit later on. There's a, a software called Mesh Mixer that can help to clean up the file to be made ready, hollowing out, for example. So if the model is solid and you need to lighten it up, hollowing out in Mesh Mixer is something that can be done very easily. If you're coming from the other side where you're in Revit, you can bring your model into Rhino or another Autodesk software called Fusion 360. And that's a software that if you're in that BIM workflow, if you're in that parametric modeling workflow, then bringing your model into Fusion 360 kind of gives you sort of that same level of functionality and capability. So I encourage you, if, you, if you're in the Autodesk Suite software, give that a, give that a try. This is a nice, just quick snapshot. We have two boxes that are overlapping each other. And if you try to say, send this to different types of printers, they may or may not balk at you in terms of being ready for printing. So just showing a quick how we can clean that up so that the bottom close one continuous contour is achieved, that's ready for printing in 99% of the printers that are on the market. This is an example of showing where, you know, I've, yes, the box is actually exploded apart, but imagine if they were touching that you were using this command in Rhino to say show edges. And if we're seeing any of the edges in purple, then that means they're not welded together. This could be examined in 3D Studio Max, it could be examined in Maya. It's not just specific to Rhino, we're just trying to demonstrate that it's important that the model is watertight. Here we're showing an example of, we have just a flat plane, and on one side, the default Rhino colors are gray, but on the other side, I've gone in and changed the actual negative side to being purple. You can make it blue, yellow, orange, doesn't matter. The point of this is that when making a model, or if you import a model into Rhino, and you see this color, you know immediately that that's a face or surface that's inverted and it needs to be addressed. SketchUp. So here we're showing an example. Um, this is a free plugin for SketchUp that allows you to begin to go in and it will, while I won't say it's a magical button, it at least starts to put you in the ballpark that the model becomes much closer to being ready for the 3D printing process. So this is found in the extensions warehouse for SketchUp. This works for all versions. Uh, 
and I'll show you some examples uh, of how this works just shortly. This is showing in SketchUp where you can actually, much like I just did in Rhino, how you can change the colors. Again, I was feeling kind of purplish. I think it was in a in a in a in a, in a Prince kind of mood, <laughs> purple rain. Um, but again, it doesn't have to be pro. It could be whatever color you want. Again, the whole point is that if you're seeing that color on the screen, it means that it needs to be addressed. Generally, from Revit, we're not seeing the same level of naked edges or inverted normals. You're really getting a really robust model from your Reviting, Revit software. What I'm showing here is how you actually export a model from Revit that if you want to bring it into, as I showed earlier, Rhino and or Fusion 360, then it's actually more advantageous to export it out so that they're actually polysurfaces or, if you will, solid geometry, not a mesh. Working on a mesh in the software or in any software, it's definitely um, a little bit more challenging than it needs to be in most instances, but this is the option where you can export your model from Revit once it's been optimized. And what we're showing is that you can see this option where you can export out as ASCII solids, not a poly mesh. So you're just choosing this option and you can actually save this as an export style. So that way it just, you can say file export DWG and then go from there. To round things out before we actually jump into the actual 3D software, so these are just, if you will, based 3D soft 3D printers that we have here on our lo our different locations within Blue Edge. So we have materials that will print in an ABS plastic material, PLA, PCABS. So depending upon where you're at in your process, what are your intended end goals or your end needs just in general? That will help us to determine which technology of these three might be chosen. Or maybe it might be metal, or maybe it might be concrete, or what have you. For the FDM process, that's pretty much what you're seeing across the board on most of your desktop printers. It's just extruding out the plastic filament layer by layer. One of the things that is different about this machine is that it's also printing a second support material. And this support material is generated automatically in the software for the printer. So once it's finished printing, we take it out of the machine, that then has to be placed into a water bath to dissolve just the support material. So if you have undercuts, if you have cantilevers, if you have overhang, that could, that's taken care of in the actual software for the machine. Next, we have a powder-based technology. This is a, a color jet. It's fully in, printing in full CMYK color, although we would not say it's a Pantone matching color technology. It's color representative is what, how we would describe it more often than not. So there are times when we may have to if you print, I'm printing a model in this technology, we'll print out some color swatches and try to do some, some, pan, some, some matching of what you're looking for output and what the machine's capabilities are. And to round things out, we have the polyjet technology. The polyjet is what we consider high resolution. This is printing at it's just an amazing level of detail and resolution and also has the capability to print in multiple materials at the same time. And it's not just mixing A into B, for example, as from a material standpoint, you can have gradations of hard, hard material, soft material, we call it rubber-like. Um, you can do clear materials. So if you have a model that you really want to accentuate to a client, we can print in that translucent material and then you put an LED light under that and then that shows how the technology for just your model, your site works and everything else, laser cut or printed in the ABS technology or the powder technology and then we'll route it out a base and we'll, we'll just drop your models in 
for it for the actual project. Okay, so that said, um, None so far. So, all right, so what we'll do now is we'll start to jump into the actual 3D software and just show workflows, not just talk about it, we'll actually be about it. Uh, so we'll start with, you know, just a model that we have here in Revit. Um, this is one of the, the sample sets. And as you can imagine, there's just a whole lot of information here in the Revit model that the machine, as simple as this may sound, the machine makes what it sees. So what's important is being able to hide the elements or hide the geometries that we know that once the architectural scale is chosen, we, we don't need to see or, or aren't important at that point in time for the project. So being able to select an element, either graphically on a tree, you can always hide in view by that category, right? So eventually, who knows, down the road, the software will have filters just automatically built in so that if you're going to whatever additive manufacturing technology you want to print this in, it will filter out that. But until such point, it's still a manual process. In terms of resources um, for the whole process, if you have a Revit file or a SketchUp file and you need us to actually help optimize, this is something that we do all the time. Um, so it's always a conversation with you. If we're looking at just the trees, again, just being able to go and hide that category. So this is part of, if you will, just that optimization process. So you can either do it graphically on the screen, or if on your keyboard you type in VV, V as in Victor, twice, it'll bring up this um, visibility uh, menu. And this just allows you to then go through and turn off the different layers or the different elements that you may or may not want to actually have printed. Uh, so again, it's definitely a little bit more of a it's always a manual process at this point in time, but you can begin to see how easy it is that the family or the categories that the different pieces of geometries are located on. Uh, I'm zooming in close here to actually, to for example, talk about the, the railing and the, the staircases, right? Is that an element that, you know, you're looking to show to the client? If it is, we may have to make the roof removable, right? We may have to actually make some of the walls removable. So it's it's a conversation. It's not just scale, hit the button and print, and then everything works out 100%. So it's always just important to help to talk with you about the process. Once you've gone through and the whole model has been optimized, so only what needs to be printed will be printed, that's when the process that I showed earlier is being able to export out as this DWG. And you can see here, if you have your settings already pre-made, you can then, you don't have to click on these three dots, but again, just to kind of show the process, you can save this as an export style. Also being very mindful of what units you're exporting out in. So if you've ever opened up a model and it was too small because it was in millimeters rather than inches or feet or centimeters, this is where you can make adjustments to the model as it's being exported. Okay, so definitely did a little bit of you know pre-flighting on this. Um, so now it might seem it's just magical, but you know, here's the, the same model you know brought into SketchUp. Right, and this came in as a component. So in order to get, <coughs> excuse me, these solid, <coughs> excuse me, these solid inspector tool to work, once you select the geometry, you see edit component and you selected it, 
you fold it apart. Then when you click on this solid inspection tool, it's going to bring up all of the things that may or may not be correct. Now, again, I don't recommend going from Revit into SketchUp. It's only if you're already working in SketchUp and you plan to go to 3D printing, this will help in that process. But at least just wanted to show the same model across the board. Uh, and then you could say File, Export, 3D Model. And then from here, you could choose um, the different formats that we showed earlier. So OBJ, STL, uh, as, as file formats. So if you do have textures or colors that you've made in SketchUp, you can choose to export a texture map and that will print to the machine in full color. Here's the same model opened up. This is the DWG file that we exported from Revit. Taking a look at, again, all the details, all the colors, one of the things that I recommend or I do is you can see all the different layers are coming in. I basically selected everything and copied it to a whole new layer. So I can see just the geometry, just what's, let's say, on the inside. And again, I'm not seeing any of those purple faces, so that's a good you know, look in terms of the model, just going through and examine it. And if you need to know, let's say for example, what, how big this model is, one of the easiest things to do is select everything and use this option called bounding box. And that will put a box that goes to the extent of your you know, geometry. So now I know that right now the dimensional size, if you look at the, the top, and it shows you how big that box is. And this, again, can help you to begin to understand in terms of architectural scale. We need to scale this down. What size does this need to be? Because at that point in time, that's when you can go over here and, let's say, for example, type in distance. And you can start to take measurements off of the model to know exactly are those details too thin, are they too thick, so on and so forth. So here I'm just going to focus on this front area and being able to make changes here in Rhino to the geometry, to thicken up geometries. These are just individual components. These are solid pieces, these are solid poly surfaces. So if we go through and again measure that as a distance, Right now, this, and this is at full scale, this is two and a half inches thick. So you gotta think in, you know, think in terms of, well, when you scale it down to, let's say, you know, three thirty seconds equals a foot, or you know, whatever scale you cho you're chosen, this is gonna scale down, and then this whole structure, that might be so thin, so you may have to go through and start to, again, optimize. So being able to pick the pieces of geometry and then scale it here to exaggerate the details so that it can be printed. Okay. Once finished again here in Rhino, you're selecting everything. And if you need to then say file, you say export selected. And then you can choose your format. So in this case, again, we can look at the OBJ. If you want to do textures or colors, you could do VRML. You could do um, STL as your file formats to export out as. What is important is that if you're going to add colors or textures to your model, that when you're applying your textures, you're applying your textures to the actual object, not the materials, uh, not, not the layers. Okay. That said, just to show one more option. So this is opening up again that same front area model here in the Autodesk software, the Fusion 360. What's nice again about it in terms of workflow and for the functionality, um, it's a parametric history-based 
system if you'd like it to, or you can actually turn it off. It's your choice. Uh, so you can see down here at the bottom, here's that same arc, you know, that detail at the bottom where I thickened it up ever so slightly. That detail or how much that was thickened, because you have the math or the dimensional value behind it, it's parametrically linked so that you can always say, well, you know what, I want, I need it to be, instead of two inches, I want it to be four, and it updates the 3D model. So that way, whatever changes you need to make, if you need to go to one technology and then the other, you come back through and just change everything accordingly. Again, once finished, once optimized, then at that point in time, it's just a matter of taking the geometry and exporting it out as the aforementioned STL, VRML, different formats, and kind of go from there. So that brings us towards, or brings us to the, you know, towards the conclusion. If you guys have questions, if you'd like to do a brunch and learn or lunch and learn, we offer that. It's AIA accredited, right? And we provide the meals at your location, or if you want to do it here at our, at our location, we offer that as well. Um, the printing models that we, if you take a look at our website, you can actually see some of the capabilities of the, in our gallery, uh, different projects that we've worked on for a wide range of different firms. It could be different, you know, small one-off models. It could be for, for clients, you know, what have you, for giveaways, for proposals, for RFQ. It's like, if you can have a model in front of a client, why wouldn't we want to put a model on the table, all right? You can definitely have renderings, you can have virtual reality, all these technologies are great, but nothing beats having a physical model on the table to present to the client. Um, so I think at this point, we're gonna open it up and just, um, if anyone has any questions, any specific details, uh, that we would like to need the need to have addressed we definitely open the floor for you guys thanks arthur um i don't see anything in the chat window so yeah at this time if anybody has any questions um feel feel free to unmute yourselves and and ask uh, also please note that we will send communication out afterwards uh, with information that arthur mentioned uh, so at this time uh, we are open for any questions or you know comments Anything at all that uh, would be would be relevant. All right, I'm gonna take that as a uh, as a no. Uh, I want to thank everyone again for attending this webinar. It's something we really feel strongly about as far as our expertise in this field and in this industry. The two combined are, are pretty unique and. And uh, I'm happy that we could uh, convey this information to all of you. And I look forward to the next time we can do it as well. Thanks again to everyone. And uh, please feel free to reach out to us if you need anything related to any of this technology. Thank you again. Thank you.